friend of man uh, What ruin by the fall How hast thee by salvation man For thou hast died for all Blessed be the name Blessed be the name of Blessed be the name of the Lord Blessed be the name Blessed be the name of Blessed be the name of the Lord. Good morning. Well, it's great to see everybody. It's good to uh, be in the house of the Lord. Amen. Well, it's great to uh, to be here. And, you know, you say, man, you keep saying that. Like, just, just think about it. anywhere else that you could be. And I, I don't just mean in church. I mean that we are blood-bought believers by the precious blood of Jesus Christ, that we are found in him and that Christ is in us, the, the hope of glory. Boy, blessed be the name. I mean, yes, absolutely. Blessed be the name. The name which uh, is the name that there's no other, other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. What a joy to know that we can know the Lord. What, what an awesome thing. Man, get, let's get that in our hearts. It's just so thrilling, so thrilling. If you're visiting with us today, I, I hope you're excited. I'm so thankful that you're here. We would love to meet you and talk with you even more. And uh, But boy, we're in, I, I believe, just for a special service. And so let's look to the Lord, ask him to bless it, and do his great, great work in our hearts. Father, we thank you. God, we bless your holy name, and, and we glorify you and, and magnify you for your greatness. And Lord, we're so thankful that we can be here together worshiping you, glorifying you, and, and just drawing close to you. Lord, we're so thankful that we can come to you through the precious blood of Jesus Christ and to enter into that holy, holiest place of all, your very presence. Thank you for sealing us with your Holy Spirit. Thank you for working in our hearts. Thank you for the grace that you give us in our time of need. And Father, glorify your name in the midst of your people once again in this service, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Hey, let's all stand to our feet. Grab your hymn book. Turn to page 243. We're going to sing Victory in Jesus. 243. Hey! 
and the old redemption story, and some sweet day I'll sing up there the song of victory. Oh, victory in Jesus, my Savior forever. He sought me and he bought me with his redeeming blood. He loved me and I knew him, and all my love is to him. He punched me to victory beneath the cleansing wine. Let's sing it again. <laughs> all right, thank you. You may be seated. Our call to worship from the Psalms comes from Psalm 143, 143. And boy, what, what a Savior. What a Savior that we have, that we have victory in Jesus. And boy, if we have victory in him, all we have to do is follow him to continue to experience the outworkings of that victory that he's already secured. I mean, to see it in our lives, to know that he hears us and helps us and that his ears are open. Wow, what a joy. What a joy. What a, what a blessing to know that we can follow the Lord. Let's read in uh, Psalm 143. I'll read aloud in case you're confused and you can read silently. The Bible says in verse 1, Hear my prayer, O Lord. Give ear to my supplications. In thy faithfulness answer me, and in thy righteousness. And enter not into judgment with thy servant, for in thy sight shall no man living be justified. For the enemy hath persecuted my soul, he hath smitten my life down to the ground. He hath made me to dwell in darkness and those that have been long de- as those that have been long dead. Therefore is my spirit overwhelmed within me. My heart within me is desolate. I remember the days of old. I meditate on all thy works. I muse on the work of thy hands. I stretch forth my hands unto thee. My soul thirsteth after thee as a thirsty land, Selah. Hear me speedily, O Lord, my spirit faileth. Hide not thy face from me, lest I be likened to them that go down into the pit. Cause me to hear thy loving kindness in the morning, for in thee do I trust. Cause me to know the way wherein I should walk, for I lift up my soul unto thee. Deliver me, O Lord, from mine enemies, I flee unto thee to hide me. Teach me to do thy will, for thou art my God. Thy spirit is good. Lead me into the land of uprightness. Quicken me, O Lord, for thy name's sake, for thy righteousness' sake. Bring my soul out of trouble, and out of thy mercy cut off mine enemies and destroy all them that afflict my soul, for I am thy servant. With these powerful words, we hear the longing the desperation of a man who craves to be led by the Lord. He says explicitly that he wants to do the Lord's will, that he wants to be taught, and he exclaims, lead me. He wants to be a follower. He wants to be someone that knows the blessing of following the Lord Jesus Christ. He is willing to put everything that he has of himself to be willing and available for the Lord's use. His spirit, his hands, his his mind, everything about him, his desire, his will. He wants all of that to crave the Lord. In fact, he goes so far to say that he thirsts after the Lord as as a parched and dry and, and, and ugly ground that just is desperate for water. I don't mean like like our, our pavement is out there or the mud, depending on how early you got to church this morning, right? How good of a parking spot you might have gotten. I don't mean nice pooling waters collecting out in a in a in a in a, in a pasture somewhere. I mean it's barren. There's a drought. It's it's so dry that as he thinks about how he needs the the replenishing power of God. It's, it's one of those dry mouth moments where your tongue sticks to the roof of your mouth and you wonder if it's ever going to come down again. Oh, Lord, I need 
you are refreshing. Come, hear me speedily, he says in verse 7. My spirit is failing. I am overwhelmed. The thing I need most is you to lead me. And if that's the desire of our heart, to be led by the Lord, it means that we desire to be his follower, to be his disciple, to learn, as the psalmist said here, to learn his will and to do it. Followers are those that desire to be led of the Lord, to be taught his will, and to find the grace to fulfill it. Are you a follower of Jesus Christ? Father, we thank you that you hear our prayer and that you give ear to our supplications. And I pray that it would be the request and desire of every person's heart in this room today that we would put our trust in you and that you would cause me and all of us to know the way wherein we should walk. And we lift up our soul to you to deliver us, to teach us, to quicken us, help us to do your will and lead us according to your greatness and for thy name's sake. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's enjoy this special from our choir. Through my disappointments, strife and discontentment, I cast my every care on the Lord. No matter what obsession, pain or deep depression, I'm standing on the solid rock. number 261, 261, 261, when we get to that second verse, we're going to pause and turn and shake hands with our neighbors as the pianist plays through a verse for us, so you be sure and get ready for that on the second verse. On the first verse, 261, let us stand. you see there's light for a look at the Savior and life for abundant and free turn your eyes upon Jesus look full in his wonderful face and the faith strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace. Turn and check a neighbor as she plays through.
Page 261, 261, on that third verse. His word shall not fail you, he promised. Believe him and all will be well. Then go to a world that is dying. His perfect salvation to tell. Turn your eyes upon Jesus. Look full in his wonderful face. And the things of her will grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace. Thank you, maybe see it. Great. Boy, watch out if you get teenagers excited, amen? Yes. All right, we'll go ahead and release the kiddos. Uh, junior church. There goes Tyler. He's left two, He's left almost all of my services. Oh. oh, boy, Damon's getting on me now. All right, the rest of us are going to turn to Matthew chapter number 4. Matthew chapter 4.
Now, as you're turning to Matthew chapter 4, we're going to be reading verses 18 through 22, but as you're turning there, I want, you, I want to get you thinking. We're going to play a little game, don't worry. You can stay right there in your seat. I won't call on anybody, but I want you to play a little word association game with me, okay? So I want you to know, and you, please, please don't shout this out, all right? But what, what pops into your mind when I say some of the words that I'm going to say? Like, for example, what pops into your mind when I say vegan? Uh-huh, uh-huh. Please, please keep your comments all to yourself, all to yourself. How about crossfitter? That's not someone that fits on a cross, all right? If you know what a crossfitter is, then something is probably coming to your mind. How about Duke fan? Hmm, hmm, yeah, yeah. Well, they're the devils for a reason, right? NASCAR fan. It's an image or a thought come to your mind. It probably does because... The odds are that you probably have a mental association with, with each and every one of those, right? Now, what comes to your mind when I say the word Christian? Odds are, again, you probably associate that word with certain characteristics as well. And the broader culture does as well. They have formed impressions about what a Christian is and whether or not they are actually a Christian or if they are not a Christian. And if you were to stop people on the street and ask them, hey, are you a Christian? Some people are going to say, well, yes. And, and others may say, well, what do you mean by that? Or they may say, yes, but I'm not like, and then they'll, they'll fill in the, the rest of the sentence, right? So some of you would say that at some point you became a Christian, right? You were, there was a point in your life, a certain time where you maybe prayed a prayer or walked an aisle or got baptized or went to a class or something and, and, and it all came together, whatever it was that was your tradition. And maybe you said, you know what? I've been a Christian all my life, that ever since I was born, I've always been a Christian. In fact, I don't remember a time where I was ever not a Christian, Right? Maybe you said that. Now, maybe there's some people here today that go, I'm, I'm definitely not a Christian. In fact, I, don't, I, I just got lost. I was looking for directions, and, and I was just looking at a nice place to sit. You say, I'm definitely not a Christian at all. Well, here is a strange yet interesting fact. The first followers of Jesus Christ did not call themselves Christians. The word Christian was actually a derogatory term used by people outside of the faith. And if you were to read Acts chapter 11, verse 26, you would see that the first Christians were known as disciples. It says there, and the disciples uh, uh, were known as Christians, all right? They, they were there, and that's only one of three places where you'll find the word Christian in the New Testament. In the whole Bible, Christians are only described as Christians three times. But you know what they are described as 281 times? Disciples. Disciple is a far more accurate and I would say compelling description of what it means to follow Jesus Christ. And you'll see as we go through here, and this is the, the text before the pretext, right? Or the, the pretext before the text. You'll see that the word disciple is far more accurate. And it's compelling, and it should compel us to follow Jesus Christ because it's terrifyingly clear that this concept of what it means to be a disciple exposes, now listen, this will expose many who claim to be Christians who are not actually disciples of Jesus Christ. I want to suggest to you that in changing the primary word that we use to describe ourselves from disciple to Christian, we've actually lost a lot of clarity that the word disciple has conveyed. What it means to be a follower of Jesus Christ and to know what that actually is. And it's clear. It's absolutely crystal clear. Because when you look at this word, you realize what you are actually becoming when you choose to believe in Jesus Christ. So we need to recapture this sense of what it means to be a disciple, what it means to be a follower of Jesus Christ. So now we come to our text in Matthew chapter 4, and we have here the calling of the first disciples. And in this passage, you'll get a glimpse of what a disciple is and how disciples saw themselves. So now let's read Matthew chapter 4, and we'll read verses 18 through 22. And Jesus, walking by the Sea of Galilee, saw two brethren, 
Simon, called Peter, and Andrew, his brother, casting a net into the sea, for they were fishers. And he saith unto them, Follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. And they straightway left their nets and followed him. And going on from thence, he saw other two brethren, James, the son of Zebedee, and John, his brother, in a ship with Zebedee, their father, mending their nets. And he called them, and they immediately left the ship and their father and followed him. Now, I don't know about you, but the story is a little too abrupt for me. Now, I didn't grow up listening to Bible stories, so when I read this story as an adult, I thought, wait a minute, wait a minute. These guys just up and left their jobs and their families to go follow a carpenter? Are you serious? Now this, if there's a Jedi mind trick in the Bible, this has to be it. But when you understand the history of what's happening here and what's going on, all of this will make a lot more sense. So let's go back and look at Jewish culture in the first century. Now, all Hebrew boys went to Torah school. That's where they learned the Torah. That's the first five books of the Old Testament. And for them, this started at about the age of five. And when the boys were five years old and it was time to start Torah school, there was a special ceremony where they'd bring all the five-year-old boys in and they would take a drop of honey and they would put it on their tongue. And while all this was happening, they were reading the story or the first chapters of Genesis. Now, these boys were mostly poor, and this would be the first time that they ever experienced sweetness in their life. And so the idea there is, is that as they're tasting the sweetness, that the word of God will become sweet to them, that it would be like this drop of honey and this sensation that filled and flooded their soul with, with joy and sweetness. That, that's what the word of God was supposed to be for them. And as they're reading these chapters of, of Genesis, they're, they're anticipating the joy and the sweetness that's going to come as they start to memorize and learn large sections of the Torah. And for the next five years, they would go through the Torah and learn it and memorize large sections of it. And by the age of 10, all these young boys knew the Torah, but the best students would go on to study the remainder of the Old Testament. Now, those that didn't make the cut, they went back to their fathers, and they would begin to learn the family business. They would be apprentices. Now, that first cut came at the age of 10, and there would be another cut at the age of 17. And so at this point, people would have to decide, these 17-year-old boys would have to decide, am I going to make a career out of religious studies? Because if so, their next step would be to, to find a rabbi, that's a teacher, uh, find a rabbi that they admired, and they would go apply to become one of their disciples. And so when they found their rabbi, they would go and sit at that rabbi's feet, and that's their way of, of requesting to learn from that rabbi. And the rabbis would examine them with a series of questions and, and put them through a, a bunch of tests to, to see if they were worthy to be their disciples, right? Now, the rabbis could choose the smartest and most talented boys to be their disciples. Because, you see, the rabbis, they, they were able to be really selective because in those days, being a religious leader and a religious ruler was the best of all possible jobs, Almost every Hebrew boy dreamed of becoming a religious expert one day. They, they didn't dream about being a basketball star or, or a rock star. Those things didn't exist back then. For them, they dreamed of becoming religious experts. So the rabbis could choose the smartest, the most talented boys to become their, their Talmud or the Talmudin, as they would say in Hebrew. Now, another reason why the rabbis could be so picky is that when they chose a disciple, they were choosing someone who they believed could become just like them. And not just to know the things that they know, but to also do the things that they did. And, and for several years, these young disciples, these Talmudim, would follow their rabbis, imitating them in every way. They would learn their mannerisms. They would learn how to answer certain questions. They would know how to respond to certain situations just the way their rabbi showed them. Now, supposedly, the highest compliment that you could pay a Talmud in those days was to say, the dust of your rabbi is all over you. Now, that wasn't like saying, hey, man, you need to go take a shower, okay? They were saying, hey, whatever it is your rabbi's stepping in, it's getting all over you. It's spraying up on you. That's how closely you are following this rabbi. Everything your rabbi does, you do. You're, all, you're covered with it completely, okay? Now, there's one more important item to note. In Jesus' day, 
there was a really rare form of rabbi who possessed a characteristic that the Jewish people called, and by the way, this is my new favorite Hebrew word, okay? It's smicha, smicha. Now, Tom, Brother Tom, who's not here, he's in New Hampshire and uh, ministering to people up there. Tom likes to pick on me because I like to use Jewish words in normal conversation. For example, I schlep across big airports, okay? I don't know if anyone schleps but I definitely schlep. My kids sometimes get some schmutz on their face, and I just take my thumb, and I just get that little schmutz right off, okay? Some of you are like, what in the world is going on? It's okay. I, I look at some people, and they get some food. Uh, do you know? Do you have a relative for mine? It's my mother-in-law. Oh, wait, I shouldn't have said that, but it's true. They get some food on their shirt every meal. It's not a real meal unless there's some food on their shirt. And if you're, and if you're embarrassed and looking around, that's you. You're the person that doesn't want to admit. We'll go ahead and point you out. Well, you look like a shlemiel, okay? That's what you look like. That's what the Jews would think. And then we would say, what are you, Meshugana? I mean, so now if you're not bilingual, I'll, I'll translate all that for you later. But let me just tell you, my new favorite Hebrew word is smicha. Smicha. Now it translates to authority. And I, and I think this word is so much cooler in Hebrew than just saying authority. He has authority. He has smicha. Now, I know some of you are looking at me. I'm going to give you permission. You can go ahead and say it. I know. You're just so overwhelmed by how cool that word is. Say, go ahead. Go ahead. It's okay. Some of you are muttering under your breath like you don't, you don't want to, you don't want to you know, be that guy. But it's okay. Just say it. Smicha. See, some of you are on board. I like it. I like it. Now, We've got it, smicha. Now that we've got that out of our system, let's note that these rabbis with smicha were very rare. They're very rare. We only actually know of about a dozen or so around the time of Jesus that were recognized as smicha rabbis. Right Now, if you know anything about Jewish history, a couple of names are going to pop out to you, like Gamaliel or Hillel. Those were recognized as smicha rabbis. These guys were masters of the Torah. They, they kind of had a mysticism about them. They had spiritual authority uh, where they were thought to be so close to God that they could provide new insights. Now, for a Jew to be open to new insights was very rare because they figured, hey, you know what? We've always known everything that there is to know, and we don't need anybody else telling us anything new. But these guys, these smicha Micah rabbis were so knowledgeable and so close to God that the new stuff was no longer frowned upon. It was welcomed because they were uh, smicha rabbis. They had all these insights that were welcomed by the people. Now, to to be regarded as a rabbi with smicha, there had to be some credible evidence that you had done some miracles. You know, easy task, right? Easy day. Let's just go out and take care of this. No, you had to be had some credible evidence that you had actually done a miracle. Now, there were some people that were regarded this way, but if you wanted to be a rabbi with smicha, two other smicha rabbis had to come along and recognize that you also were a smicha rabbi. So it's a very, very small, exclusive club. It's the good old boy system for rabbis, right? Very hard to get into. Now, that's all the cultural history. Let's take a look back at our text with that understanding in mind. And the Bible says in verse number 18, And Jesus walking by the Sea of Galilee. And I'm going to pause right there because we want to talk about Jesus. So here comes Jesus. He's walking by the Sea of Galilee. And this is the Jesus that knows the Torah so well that at the age of 12, he's correcting the religious leaders. Those guys that had made a career out of being a religious ruler. He's correcting them at the age of 12. In fact, in his public ministry, he frequently says things like, uh, you you know, uh, you've heard it said in the past or you've heard it said in days of old, but I'm saying to you now, because he's demonstrating his new interpretation authority. And that happens all throughout the New Testament. He, He sees Uh, that he's able to interpret this, and he does it with new smicha, with new authority. And when people see this, his hearers, they're constantly amazed by his authority. In fact, just a couple of chapters after Matthew chapter 4, we get to Matthew chapter 7, the, the Bible says there that his audience, they were astonished because he taught them as one having authority. Or if we were to say it in Hebrew, smicha. He's teaching them as one having smicha. Not as the scribes, because all the scribes do is repeat everything that they've heard. They're the parrots of the first century. They're just repeating everything. But the, the audience, his followers are going, whoa, 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 whoa. He's got smicha. Where, where did he get this from? Where did you get the smicha? Somebody, please, please tell me. Who, who conferred this upon you? Because you're, you're doing all these miracles, Jesus. How, how is it that you can do these things? 
Well, that's a good question. So right before this account in Matthew chapter 4, we read in Matthew chapter 3 that, uh, that Jesus goes out into the wilderness where there's the man John the Baptist, you know, that camel skin wearing, locust and honey eating prophet that was preaching out in the wilderness with smica dripping off of him, right? And then at the same moment that Jesus is baptized, God the Father speaks from heaven and says, this is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. Now at this point, the, the smica light on your dashboard should be lighting up. You should be driving along and going, oh, Jesus has smica. It's right there. God the Father, John the Baptist, clearly it's obvious to everybody that Jesus has authority. Okay, now back to verse number 18 and 19. And Jesus, walking by the Sea of Galilee, saw two brethren, Simon called Peter and Andrew his brother, casting a net into the sea, for they were fishers. And he said unto them, follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. Now Jesus, okay, this new rabbi, just shining with smica, chooses Simon, Peter, and Andrew, who were fishermen. Now the fact that they were fishermen, what does that tell you about them? It tells you they did not make the cut at the age of 10, like the other boys did. They were the B team. They were not the top of their class. They were not chosen to go any further in scriptural studies. Friends, can, can we just, before we go on any further, wrap our minds around this. When Jesus assembled his team by his choice in order to transform the world, he chose the B team. He skipped over all the A players. He, he skipped over all the Division I athletes at all the biggest schools, all the best schools like the University of Florida, found in its initial state in Jerusalem, I'm sure. He skipped all the Division I athletes, and he went right for the JV team. Those kids that don't even know how to, play ba- how to bounce a basketball down the court without it getting stolen. He picked the B team. So the point is, of course, of course, they wanted to follow him. They, they wanted to be with a rabbi all along. They, they wanted to be with a rabbi that had smicka. And all of a sudden, he comes along and he chooses them. There are these guys uh, w- without much potential, really, and without any personal power. But yet here comes Jesus walking by the Sea of Galilee, and he chose them. He chose them, the B team, to follow him, to become like him, to know God the way that Jesus knew God. And to, and to do what Jesus did and to be filled with his power. They were chosen for that. Now, there's a few things that we need to understand about what it means to be a disciple right here. And if you're taking notes, please mark down that this is what it means to follow Jesus. Following Jesus means you are willing and available. Jesus does not choose the best. He chooses the willing. I was told in college regularly, God chooses the best for ministry. Now that's a great recruiting slogan, something like the few, the proud, the Marines. Something that you can aspire to, you can be a part of greatness, and that one day you too could be great and and go to sunny, beautiful Camp Lejeune and spend your life there. Oh wait, that didn't make it to the billboard, did it? Jesus doesn't choose the best. He chooses the willing. The idea that God chooses the best is not what the Bible teaches. God chooses the willing. John MacArthur observed something similar. He said, in choosing his disciples, Jesus skipped all the great scholars of Egypt. He skipped all the great philosophers in Athens. He skipped the powerful in Rome. He passed over Herodotus the historian, and Socrates, the great thinker, and Julius Caesar, the great ruler. He chose men to be his disciples who were so ordinary, it's comical. Not a single rabbi. No teachers. No religious experts. Not even one synagogue ruler. Half of them were fishermen. One was essentially an IRS agent, and one of them was a former terrorist. Inshallah. He chose the B team because Jesus' work in the world would not come from their abilities. It would come from what he would do through them. You see, 
People with a lot of talent and ability would only get in the way because they never really have to learn what it means to lean on Jesus and to trust and rely on his power. You see, Jesus taught that his power in the weakest vessel was infinitely greater than the greatest talent apart from him. And I love how Jesus reinforces this and sends this home for his disciples. In Matthew chapter 11, verses 9 through 11, Jesus is talking with his disciples there, and he says, he says, of all of those that were ever born of women, by the way, that's everybody, the greatest preacher ever to live was Joe the Baptist. No, that's false. John the Baptist. John the Baptist was Jesus's favorite all-time preacher. I mean, on Jesus' iPod, he had John the Baptist sermons fully stocked and totally downloaded. Okay, he loved him some John the Baptist. Now, he said to his disciples, John the Baptist is the greatest preacher, hands down, right? But I'm going to tell you something true. (laughs) Those who are least in my kingdom are greater than John the Baptist, I mean, just imagine the impact of that. You're sitting there listening, and you understand that Jesus thinks John is the best preacher, and then he just says, but you can be greater. Can you imagine that? What does it mean to be least in the kingdom of heaven? It means that you know the least about the Bible. (laughs) It means you have the least amount of talent. You are the least eloquent. You have the least number of spiritual gifts. Now, somebody that I'm talking to right now, somebody in this building is the least in the kingdom of God at Liberty Baptist Church. Now look, I'm not trying to be mean, but mathematically it has to be true that one of you in here is the least talented, the least capable, the least eloquent, and knows the least about the Bible. Okay, I see that hand. Right now you're thinking, I think he may be talking about me. And God in heaven is saying, yep, I'm talking about you. (laughs) You're at the bottom of the pile. But even if that's accurate, okay, even if that's accurate, whoever you are, you have more potential for power in ministry than John the Baptist, who was the greatest preacher that ever lived. Why? Because you have something that John the Baptist did not, and that's the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit inside of you. And Jesus said, from that point on, it was no longer about your abilities for Jesus. It was all about your willingness and availability to be used by Jesus. He didn't choose you because he thought you could be a great dad or a great mom or a great witness or a great preacher. He chose you because he knew that you would be willing to be a vessel that he could work through. And the Holy Spirit in the mouth of one believer is more powerful than an army of the most eloquent orders in the world. You understand that? I should be like a drill instructor. No, I said, do you understand that? Hi, sir. Okay. That's all right. We'll just play the game. I got more games than Parker Brothers. Now, I saw a really good example of this truth that you need to be willing and available and God will use you. I saw a great example of this when I was in college. The gal's name was Joanna Fraunhofer. All right? You can't say it ten times fast, so don't worry about it. She was a quiet girl in college. All right? Now, when I say quiet, I mean to hear her speak was about as rare as finding a $3 bill. I really personally believe that she was in a competition with the Lord to see who could win the Still Small Voice contest. Okay, like, it, it was very rare. When she did talk, it was soft, it was mousy, you know. And, and, but, but there's something about Joanna that always shocked me, is that she often had a friend with her from work at church that she would bring with her. Now, I'm amazed at this for several reasons, mostly because she would talk to people, And maybe people came because they were equally as stunned, like, oh my goodness, Joanna said something. Of course, I better go talk to this church, or I better go see this church that this girl is finally talking about, right? But here's the thing. Even though she was quiet, nature, right, she was willing, and she was available to simply do what the Holy Spirit told her to do when he told her to do it. There's no secret sauce. There's no special formula. That's it. She was willing. She was available. But as we look at this, we have to ask, are we willing? Are we available? Am I listening to the Holy Ghost and and doing what he's telling me to do? Because here's the truth. Once again, the Holy Spirit in the mouth of one available believer is more powerful than an army of the best 
best speakers on the planet. He didn't choose you because you were awesome. (laughs) He wanted to make you awesome because he chose you. Your awesomeness is not going to come from your abilities. Your awesomeness is going to come from his power through you. So now the question is is not how able are you? The question is how available are you? Because as the saying goes, your greatest ability is availability. Have you surrendered yourself to him to say, God, I'm going to stop making excuses and I'm going to stop looking into my family and into my marriage and into my life and ministry and into my workplace and, and I'm no longer going to ask, what can I do? But instead, I'm going to ask, what can Jesus do through me? He doesn't need your ability. He only requires your availability. And often, as we often say, he doesn't call the equipped. He equips the call. Have you made yourself available? He does not choose the best. So don't worry about being the best. He he chooses the willing. Now the willing will soon discover that following Jesus means believing that God will fulfill his purpose through you. Two words simply recorded in chapter 4 of Matthew in verse number 19 follow me. As I explained, the the normal way this all went down was was that if you were among the best of the class, you apply to a rabbi, and if he liked what he saw, then he'd choose you. Now, his selection would give his disciples a great deal of confidence. And so if they were struggling, they could say, ah, but my rabbi believed in me. He chose me, right? He must have seen something in me. I mean, if if you were to be approached by great... Great coaches in North Carolina, like Roy, the, the great Roy Williams or Mike Krzyzewski, right? And they came up to you and were like, man, you got a lot of talent. I want to see you on my basketball team. While everyone else was making fun of you, you could still say, you know what? But that man saw something in me, right? Now check this out. Jesus didn't have those guys come sit at his feet. He came seeking them. They weren't even looking for Jesus. Do you understand the kind of confidence that that would give to those disciples? And for us, in the midst of a world where where we feel overwhelmed by opposition, we can be confident that God chose you and that God is going to see you through to fulfill his purpose in your life. It doesn't matter what the size of the obstacles are in front of you. It matters the size of the God behind you. And that God is greater than any of the obstacles that are standing in your way of following Jesus. In fact, Jesus said it himself in John chapter 16 and verse 33, I have overcome the world. So stop worrying about the obstacles and start focusing on God. That's the whole point of choosing. Now watch this. In John chapter 15 and verse 16, Jesus himself explains this concept. He says there, Ye have not chosen me, but I have chosen you and ordained you that you should go and bring forth fruit, and that your fruit should remain, that whatsoever you shall ask and the, uh, ask of the Father in my name, he may give it to you. Now here's what Jesus is saying. You didn't choose me, I chose you. I appointed you that you would go out and bear fruit. To bear fruit means that you're going to lead other people to Jesus and that that fruit will last. It's not a temporary thing. The fruit is permanent. It's eternal. And so whatever you need, whatever you ask in the name of Jesus to help fulfill that, he's going to give it to you. The point is not that Jesus is saying, hey, check it out. Let's talk about Calvinism for a minute, right? No, he's not saying that at all. What he's saying is, I've chosen you and I've planned for you to fulfill a purpose And I'm going to pursue that purpose in you, and I'm not going to let it drop. Even when you lack confidence in yourself, you can put confidences in the person and purpose of Jesus Christ. Because even when you and I falter, he will never fail. But isn't this where our confidence fails? A lot of times we talk about how People or maybe even ourselves have lost confidence in Jesus, but it's not really our confidence in Jesus that we've lost. What we lost was our confidence that Jesus would do through us what he said he would do. Isn't that right? Let me give you a couple of examples. 
First good one comes from the Bible, Matthew chapter 14. The disciples are in the midst of a storm, and they think they're going to sink. And here comes Jesus walking on the water, and Peter's like, hey, Jesus, is that you? This is the King Joe version, so don't get upset. Hey, Jesus, is that you? And he says, hey, it's me. Uh, What do you want to do? And he says, if it's you, I'm going to come on out. I'm going to hop out of this boat. I'm going to come out there. And he says, it's me. Come on down. You're the next contestant. And so Peter hops out, and he's walking on the water. We're like, bam, he's out of the water. Look at that. That's amazing. And then what happens? Everything went from being awesome to being awful. Peter takes a few steps, and he sees the waves, and what does he do? He panics, and he starts to sink. And that's where we say, oh, see, look at that. He loses confidence in Jesus. Is that really true? I don't think so. Here's why. He's fully confident in Jesus, who, by the way, is still standing on the water, still walking up there. Jesus is doing just fine. In fact, Jesus is doing so fine that when Peter starts sinking, he is so confident in Jesus that he calls out and says, Jesus, save me. He didn't lose his confidence in Jesus's ability to walk on water. He lost confidence in Jesus's ability to make him walk on the water. Do you see the difference? Where our confidence is, usually falters is not in the character of Christ. Our confidence falters in the promise of Jesus to do through you what Jesus said he would do. Now let's look at it like this. You're fully convinced that if Jesus was married to your spouse, he'd be doing an awesome job, wouldn't he? But what you're not confident of is that Jesus can use you to become the kind of husband or wife that you're supposed to be. You're confident that if Jesus were raising your kids, he'd be doing a great job. But that's not what he promised. He didn't promise to raise your kids. He promised to raise your kids through you. You're confident that if Jesus was in your workplace, he'd be doing a great job as a witness. But that's not what he promised. He promised that he would do all of these things through you and me. And when your confidence falters and and my confidence falters... When life smacks us down, when we fail, when we feel like we're up against insurmountable obstacles in our marriage, with our kids, with our career, with our ministry, we have to remember that faithful is he which called you who also will do it. That he which hath begun a good work in you shall perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. That what God has purposed, he will bring it to pass. We have to say exactly like Paul said, that I know whom I have believed with the attitude and all, amen. I know who I have believed and am persuaded that he is able to keep that which I have committed unto him against that day. When I am faithless, God will be faithful. He can't deny himself. When I'm unable, he is always able. When Jesus chose us, he had a plan. He had a plan for our marriage. He had a plan for our family. He had a plan for us to bring forth fruit, and not a single bit of it depended on the amount of of ability that I brought to the table. What it depended on was his ability to do it through me and to do it through you. And you've got to put your confidence in that. Whenever I have somebody at the church come up to me, maybe at the end of a service, or they snag me just before the beginning of a service, and, 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 and this, this happens a lot given the nature of our church, they tell me they, they are having to move away because, because of a job, right? That their job is transferring them, and you can see the, you see the look of fear in their eyes, and, 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 they, and they, they say something like this, and it's so complimentary, it's so wonderful. They say, this church, this church means so much to me, and, 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 and God's done so much in my life here, and, and, you know, my, my job is it's transferred me, and I just I don't know what church I'm going to go to, and, and, I, and I, I don't know, you know, what, what kind of support group I'm going to have, and, and I don't know what kind of friends uh, that I'm going to have there, that friends my wife is going to have, or friends that my, my kids are going to have. And I'll be honest with you, I needed an answer. I need an answer, and you need an answer, and y'all need an answer from me, and that means I need an answer from God. And God has an answer. It's found in Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 10. And I read there, for we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. 
God has pre-ordered, he has predestined good works for you to do and to walk in, which means that God went ahead like, like he's your personal travel secretary, and he went ahead and put in place all the things that you were going to do and need, and that he put in place the places that you were going to go, and he preordained these good works for you to do and to walk in. Or in other words, he set up the support group that you needed already in advance. He picked out the friends that you needed and that you would have. He made sure that everything was in place for you to overcome temptation and to grow with him. Your job is not to go there and try to figure out what those things are. Your job is to go there and to look to the Lord Jesus Christ to lead you into the things which he has already planned and purposed for your life. He said it. He's going to do it. He's chosen you. He's chosen our path. He's arranged the good works that we will need to do to fulfill his plan, and he is with us, and he'll never leave us or forsake us, and it doesn't matter the amount of ability because he's just looking for us to trust him. And if we're going to trust him, we got to understand that following Jesus also means that we are, to, that we are called to know him and to know his word. Our calling to follow Jesus means that we are developing this trust in him by enjoying his presence. Again, the two words, if we follow this prescription, we'll do exactly what the Lord wants us to do. Follow me. Our fundamental calling as disciples is to know and to be with Jesus. And to know him, you have to spend time with him. And to spend time with him means you have to soak in every word that comes out of his mouth. You know, at a critical point in Jesus' public ministry, Jesus asked his disciples if they knew who he really was in Matthew chapter 16. Who say you that I am? Do you really know Jesus? Can you really claim to be a disciple? Now listen, you have so many outlets here, and we've tried to facilitate this for you. You have so many ways that you can take advantage in order to answer that question, do I really know Jesus? There are weekly messages, there are life groups, there are special studies in our app. We have books out in the lobby with journals and checklists and devotionals. We have apps that you can use to help memorize the Word of God. And if you're really serious about being a disciple, you'll take advantage of a lot of these things. And I don't mean just just coming to hear me teach once a week. If you're serious, if you're really serious about being a disciple, you're going to take take advantage of every chance to get in the Word. You're going to get in the Word every single day all on your own. You're going to be memorizing scriptures. You're going to be uh, reading books about the Bible. You're going to be listening to sermons and podcasts uh, or, or listening to the radio. You're going to saturate yourself in the Word of God. I mean, here's the question to put it in first century terms. Do you want the dust of your rabbi all, all over you? Because you should. If you want the dust of your rabbi, Jesus Christ, all over you, then you're going to have to have his word saturating you, get it inside of you until it dominates your thinking and and it dominates all of your behavior until you think it and talk it and quote it so that way when life cuts you, you bleed God's word. I had a pastor that used to say that if a mosquito were to bite you, it should fly away singing, there's power in the blood. Hey, is the dust of your rabbi all over you? Well, if you want it all over you, learn his word. Spend time getting to know Jesus. Because as disciples, we do this because following Jesus means to choose to leave all. Let's read verses 20 through 22. And they straightway left their nets and followed him. And going on from thence, he saw other two brethren, James, the son of Zebedee, and John, his brother, in a ship with Zebedee, their father, mending their nets, and he called them. And they immediately left the ship and their father and followed him. Now, to follow him, we see you got to leave it all. Immediately, they left their nets and their ship as well as their father. Now, why do you think the author chose to pick those two things to highlight? Well, it's because they represent the two most significant things in our lives, right? The nets and the boat represent our career, right? It's what you depend on to take care of yourself. Your father, well, that would be the most significant relationship that you have. And Jesus says, basically, to follow me, I have to take precedence over both of those things, your career and your relationships. Now, I'm going to be real with you, okay? 
most of you to follow Jesus, you're not actually going to lose your father or mother. Now, some of you will. Brother Wisdom Nyack, our missionary to India, he and his family have been ostracized from their extended family for five generations because they forsook their religion for Jesus Christ and to follow his teachings. I have friends who are former Catholics that turned their back on the church and their family turned their back on them. But most of you are not going to experience that. And for those of you that do, it's a bitter experience. We know that Jesus is sweeter, sweeter than honey. Now, most of you are not going to be asked to leave your job to follow Jesus. Now, Jesus may lead some of you to transfer from here to some place where we plant a church one day. That may happen. A few of you may be asked to quit your job altogether to enter vocational ministry. That is what happened with me. It may happen with a few of you. But for many of you, uh, it's not going to be that dramatic. But you are going to have moments in your life where you have to decide what holds greater sway over your life. Let me give you some examples. Students, God may lead you to take a summer and to go on mission after you graduate or go live with one of our church plants, and, and you're going to go tell your parents, and they're going to say, I forbid it. There's no way. There's no way. And you're going to have to decide in that moment who has greater sway over you in your life, your mother and father who gave birth to you or Jesus who created you and died for you. High school students, you're going to be one of the only ones, perhaps even the only one at times, who chooses to follow Jesus out of your set of friends. And yes, I'm talking to those of you that go to Christian school too. I've worked at three Christian schools and sent my kid to a fourth. And let me tell you, not everyone that calls themselves a Christian at those schools is actually a disciple of Jesus Christ. Time and dignity prevent me from sharing even more stories. Not everyone who claims to be a disciple actually will act like one. And you're going to be labeled that religious chick or the virgin or something else like that just to mock you and make fun of you. And you're going to have to decide right then at that moment who has more sway over your life, your friends or Jesus Christ. You're either going to sit back and be intimidated or you're going to stand up for Jesus. And if Jesus has a larger presence in your life than those friends, you're going to be just fine. You're going to be just fine. Some of you are in business. You're going to face temptations to cut corners. I mean, everyone's doing it, right? So you might as well do it too. But you're going to have to decide if you're going to be patient and do things God's way and do it the right way. For some of you, it's simply going to be what you do with your income. Scripture teaches in unequivocal, uh, I can't even say the word, in crystal clear, plain as day language, that you give your first and your best back to Jesus when you're his follower, which usually starts at about 10% for Christians. Now, this is where I see many Christians decide they're really not going to be a disciple of Jesus Christ. Without biblical justification, they will decide, this is just where I draw the line. I'm just not going to obey God here. They don't let, in any of these circumstances, they don't let Jesus have the greater sway than their boat does. You see, to follow Jesus means you subject everything in your life to his lordship. You forsake all that he has forbidden, and you pursue all that he has prescribed, and you do so unconditionally. But when you leave the boat behind and let Jesus have the greatest sway in your life, you embark on the greatest journey, the greatest journey that you've ever been on. And we see that following Jesus means spiritually reproduce. In verse number 19, Jesus says, follow me and I will make you fishers of men. And in here we see his commandment for us to reproduce spiritually. He says, I will make you fishers of men, just like he was a fisher of men. The disciples, his followers, would go on to become fishers of men. This is an essential part of being a disciple. It's not something that just a few of us do. It's not limited to a department. 
It's something that Jesus says all of us do. In fact, Jesus will go so far to say that if this is not a part of what you do, then you're not really my disciple. Now, I get it. I get it. You're saying, hey, hey, bro, it's time to look at the clock. I know you're a little dramatic and things are getting a little, a little amped up. You're sweating buckets up there. What's going on? We know you love the drama. And that's true. I can't deny any of that. But am I overspeaking just for the sake of being dramatic? For the sake of argument, I'll call your bluff. If you look at John chapter 15 and verse 8, Jesus says, Herein is my Father glorified, that you bear much fruit. And so shall ye be my disciples. How are you going to prove that you're his disciple? You're going to bear fruit spiritually. You're going to reproduce spiritually. Which means that if you are really his disciple, this is going to be a part of your life. And if you're not reproducing spiritually, you have good reason to question whether or not you're actually a disciple at all. The great commission that Jesus gave to us was this, in essence, that we go into all the nations and teach them. That is, we make disciples of all the nations, then we baptize them, and we teach them all the commandments of Jesus Christ, according to Matthew chapter 28, verses 19 and 20. And the words, go, baptize, and teach, are all participles, meaning there's one central anchor that we have to focus on, one verb in that sentence, and that verb is make disciples, teach disciples all nations, which means, if you were reading this in Greek, that the center of everything that we're doing, the baptizing, the going, the teaching, the center of everything is making disciples. Everything that we do in church has to be about making disciples. It's the core of what we do. So in our lives, we have to ask, is the chief verb that's in operation in our life to make disciples? Yes, we have a lot of of ministries at this church, but everything that we do in ministry grows out of the call to make disciples. Of all the ministries, that is the very core. Sure, we, we love to show kindness, and we want to meet needs where, wherever we see them, and we want, to, uh, we want to help the homeless and the orphan and the underprivileged and the unwed mother, but the core of all that help is teaching them about the salvation of Jesus Christ. And, and, and some, of you, some of you are moved by the needs of this world, and, and that's awesome. That's fantastic. You're moved by the needs of all the people that are around you, but the greatest need in this world is, for the, is the need for people to hear about the salvation of Jesus Christ. Some of you are moved by suffering. We have suffering in Turkey. We've had suffering in the Middle East for as long as we can remember. There's suffering all over the world, suffering in Haiti, suffering after every natural disaster. We're moved by the plight of the refugee and people all over the world. And that's awesome to have that kind of compassion. But the greatest of all suffering is eternal suffering, which people who are outside of Jesus will experience. Which means give. Give to their needs. Give your life to meet those needs. Give your life to relieve suffering. But as a disciple of Jesus Christ, know that the greatest needs that you can meet and the greatest suffering that you can relieve are the needs of people to hear about Jesus and to experience his salvation. So in everything that you do, let the controlling verb in your life be, let's make disciples. You see, Jesus summarized his life in this way, according to Luke chapter 19, that the Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which is lost. Doesn't that mean that if we are his disciples... That's how we should summarize our lives too. Joe is here to seek and to save the lost. If the dust of my rabbi is all over me, isn't that what my life will look like? It's the primary thing that we do, and it involves every single believer. It's not something that we just do here or there. It's something that each of you, as followers of Jesus Christ, have been called and appointed to do individually. You. He has called you to go and bring forth fruit. In, in a book called The Master Plan of Evangelism by Robert Coleman, one of the books that's probably one of the most important books in my life that I've read, and it's formed and shaped how I understand ministry, and even more importantly, how to follow Jesus, something he said there stands out. He says, when will the church learn this lesson? Preaching to the masses, which is what we're doing now, right? Preaching to the masses, although necessary, will never suffice in the work of preparing leaders for evangelism. Nor can occasional prayer meetings and training classes for Christian workers fulfill this job. Individual women and men are God's method. God's plan for the Great Commission for discipleship is not some thing. 
For Holly Ridge, it's not Vacation Bible School, and I love me some Vacation Bible School. But I hate to break it to you, it's not VBS. His plan for Holly Ridge is not for this pulpit to get louder and louder. His plan for this county is not even our Easter service, and we're fixing to invite 5,000 people to that. His plan is for you, individually, men and women, to go out and share the gospel. His plan is not something, it's someone. It's you. You are God's method. That's why we've spent weeks and weeks in Sunday school teaching you how to be ready for gospel encounters. That's why you hear this sermon, these sermons, week after week on Sunday mornings. It's, it's why, because this, this year, we want you to become, by God's grace, a reproducing Christian. And right now, even here, I want you to commit to it. Now, don't let this intimidate you. Disciple-making is simply teaching somebody else how to follow Jesus like you follow Jesus through the power of the Holy Spirit. Sometimes it means studying the Bible together. Even more than that, it may mean opening up your life to let other people in. Discipleship is just teaching people how to follow Jesus just like you follow Jesus. And Jesus has promised to help you do that. You say, well, what am I supposed to do? Well, let me put the cookies on the bottom shelf. I'll make this as practical as I can. I'll give you a few things to do that I'm asking you to do, and we'll button this up. First of all, I'm asking you to get engaged in the church. The best way is for you to be present at church. Now, pardon my bluntness. You should always be worried when the preacher says, now listen, I love you. Church starts at 9 a.m. There are different segments of church that start at 10 and 11. But the church has agreed to meet at 9 a.m. And by the way, we made church attendance even easier by consolidating all of our services and giving you more rest time in the afternoons, and we feed you. Let me skip the notes and let you in on my modus operandi. When I make administrative decisions, as I oversee the affairs and operations of this church, Part of my desire is to remove every single excuse that any of us could have. Oh, you don't have tracks? I got 2,000 tracks for you back there. Oh, you don't know how? We're going to spend three months teaching you how. Oh, you know, it's real hard to come back on Sunday evenings? I hear you. We'll move it. You get up earlier than that for work. Oh, I, I don't know this. I don't know that. I will do everything within my power to remove every single excuse you have to put the ball completely in your court. And as mean and as blunt and as direct as that is, let me remind you, you pay me to do this. I love you, church. My buddy, Fusselman, we call him the fuss. Always makes a fuss about something. (laughs) Okay. He sent me a shirt one time, or he's had, he had a shirt that he had for his chapel. He's an army chaplain. And I loved it because it says, make disciples, not excuses. Are you a disciple or are you an excuse maker? You'll be one or the other. You may be a Christian, but you cannot call yourself a disciple without fulfilling your covenant agreement to this local body, to gather when the church has decided to gather. And by the way, we meet Wednesdays at 7 to pray for and with one another, and then we get saturated in the word through preaching. God expects you to participate in the life and purpose of this church, which practically means that every member can legitimately expect everyone else to be here for all the services, including special meetings, conferences, and Saturday saturation blitzes. Now, to be honest with you, because I want to deal fairly, I do not have scripture to justify anyone coming to church three or four times. It's real tough. Because what I do have, according to Acts chapter 5 and verse 42, is justification for us to have church services every day of the week. And daily in the temple and in every house, they cease not to teach and preach Jesus Christ. Hey, I'm coming over tomorrow, 6 o'clock. I like chicken. Wait, you can do that? Apparently I can. (laughs) Now look, I'm a level with you. I get it. 
I don't say this lightly, and as a counselor, I do not purport to say that I understand exactly the experiences that one may have. But I've been where I've had a young family, more than a full-time job, working in a place that oversees, that oversaw two major wars in a theater of catastrophe. I lived 45 minutes from church, and we weren't late, and we didn't miss ministering to people, and we volunteered in ministries, didn't get paid while I was in seminary full-time, and a co-pastor. Now, I'm no hero, but let me let you in on the secret sauce. I'm here to tell you how it got done. One of the big reasons that we could do what we did is this lady right here. My wife was and is an awesome partner in life and ministry. Let me just give you a word to the wise. It may be helpful for you, husbands and wives, to work together to prepare your families to be in the services and take advantage of the opportunities. You can do it. You may have to sacrifice, but you can do it. I'm also asking you to get involved and get engaged in a life group. Be committed to our service teams. Everything that we do here is for the proclamation of the gospel. We do these things to remove barriers for people, from people hearing the gospel. We serve and strive together to create a gospel culture. All that we do in all of our services, our teams, our life groups, is to demonstrate the values that we hold most dear, to worship, to connect, to grow, and to serve. That's what it's all about. And if you aren't sure how to get involved, come talk to me or attend a New Steps class. Either way, there has to come a moment in your life where you move from spectator to disciple. Because getting engaged is where it's going to happen if you're going to live this out and put this in place. And if you're not engaged, get engaged now. And maybe, and probably most importantly, what I want you to walk away with here is to identify the one that you are going to pray for this year to have an encounter with Jesus Christ. Who is your one? I'm going to challenge you to have one person this year that with the help of God, you're going to introduce to faith in Jesus Christ. You cannot control the outcome, nor will I hold you accountable for that. Certainly if God doesn't, I have no right to. So I'm not putting that on you, but I am asking if you will commit to God and say, God, will you show me the one person that I'm supposed to share faith in Christ with. Now listen, what would be the effect on this county if the hundred or so people who call themselves Christians at our church took this seriously? What if every single one would bring one person to faith in Jesus Christ this year? What if every life group committed to reach at least one person outside of the church this year? Can you imagine? Can you imagine the effect that that would have? Listen, listen, friends. People are waiting at the end of your obedience. Your neighbors want you to do this. But it all comes down to this. Jesus said, follow me. He didn't bully them. He didn't coerce them. He didn't even incentivize the call. He just said, let's walk together. Let's do life together. Let's fulfill our purpose together. Have you ever seen a man walking with his dog and there's no leash? You ever wonder how that's possible? <laughs> because they have a relationship. Everyone knows their place. The master leads. The dog follows. And if you follow God, you walk with God, he doesn't have to jerk you through the neighborhood. He, he, he doesn't have to jerk you to come to church. He doesn't have to jerk you around to give. He doesn't have to jerk you around to share the gospel. You will want to be with your master and obey his commands. Now, here's my question for you. It's twofold. First of all, are you a disciple? Are you a disciple? Maybe you've never understood that until now, but maybe here you actually understand it's time for me to become a disciple and not just a Christian. Have you committed to following Jesus? Do you understand who it is that's calling you, the, the rabbi with smicka. He doesn't just give new insights. He speaks to the wind and the waves, and, and those obeyed. He commands demons, and they fled away. He spoke to diseases, and they were healed. And he talked to people in the graves, and they came out of, the, of those graves. By him, all things exist. By his blood, we're redeemed. By his glory and for his glory, we're created. He has no rival. There is no equal. Jesus is the one that calls you, and he deserves more than casual association and casual church attendance. He deserves total abandonment of sin, and he deserves complete and utter 
adoration. Wouldn't you agree? Some of us in here today may need to stop being Christians and start being disciples. Now, those of you that may not know the gospel, let me share the gospel with you. The gospel is that you cannot save yourself. Nothing you could do or can do will save you. But that's why Jesus came to die for you, because he died in your place and in my place. And rather than condemning us to death and hell, he offers us a free gift of salvation. It's free. Just receive it by faith. And the one condition that, uh, that it takes to becoming his disciples, that you understand, it, you must surrender all. There's a reason we sing songs at the end that says, I surrender all. Why? That's what it takes. You no longer trust yourself, rely on yourself, hope in yourself. You surrender all to Jesus Christ. I don't care what kind of prayer you prayed. I don't care what kind of family you grew up in. Have you become a disciple? Now, part B to this question is, are you engaging in mission? Are you reproducing yourself spiritually? Because what I've been showing you is that if you're not, you're not actually a full disciple. The call to follow Jesus and the call to make disciples are one and the same. Identify your one and commit to it. Are you a disciple? And if not, maybe you're the one that needs to come today. Let's all stand to our feet. I've said enough as the Lord leads you and as the piano plays. Allow the Lord to guide your decisions and commit to being a disciple. Heavenly Father, we thank you that you are worthy to be followed. And Lord, I pray that we would make a decision to follow you, to follow Jesus. And Lord, that you'll give us grace to help us in our time of need. Give us grace that we may follow you and lead us in a straight path. And Lord, help us to be reproducing Christians and to take this seriously. And Lord, we'll glorify you for it. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you. You may be seated. And a couple of things, all the kiddos are coming back in. It's, it's not only because I preached a really long time, and I appreciate you allowing me to do that. Um, but we have a baptism today that I'm going to get ready for right after I do these uh, announcements here real quick. But I wanted to pass on, uh, we have some events in the bulletin. We have some life groups coming up, both of which take place on February 18th. Uh, the Young at Heart Life Group is meeting at the Lopez's house, and the Young Family Life Group is going to be meeting at the Long's house. Uh, so note the times there, and if you have any questions, you can speak to those. Um, the Lopez's are not here, so um, in fact, uh, they're in, uh, they're traveling, they're going to see quite a bit of family. So if you have any questions, you can bring those to me, and if I don't know the answer, then I'll talk to, uh, I'll talk to Juan about that. Uh, please mark down uh, that we have our evangelistic outreach meetings, the Who's Your One meetings that are coming up February 24th, 25th, and 26th. And uh, we'll be joined by evangelist Tim Thompson. They are amazing. They're amazing. They're great, great. We've, we've known Tim for a little while now and his uh, sweet wife, Brittany. And so please pray for them. But I encourage you to attend all of these services. You're going to get a huge blessing. The schedule is right there for you written down. And on that Saturday, we're having our Saturday Saturation Outreach Blitz. And so everybody can do something. Even if you can't go out and walk, you can come and pray. So we're going to give you some donuts and coffee. And while everyone else goes out to share the John and Romans, you can uh, stay behind and pray. We're going to have an organized prayer meeting for about 10 or 15 minutes, and then you can feel free to take off after that. But even if you can't go out and pound the pavement and do those things, you can come, you can drive a vehicle to help us get where we need to go, and you can stay for the prayer meeting. Everybody, everybody, everybody can do something, you know? 
And so we're encouraging you to do that. Okay, uh, with the missions conference coming up, uh, I would remind you, if you have Mars jars, you want to bring them in, uh, go ahead and bring those in. If you don't know what one is, it's a little coin uh, collecting jar, uh, whatever those are called, little banks, I guess. And uh, we try to fill those up with our loose change and we bring them in around our, um, uh, around our missions conference time. And that week, the 22nd, it's not in your bulletin, but we're going to have a special midweek prayer service. Now, it's still, still Wednesday at 7 o'clock on the 22nd of February, but we're calling this the Lord of the Harvest prayer service. It's going to be a, a very specially tailored and designed um, uh, service with special music and specific scripture readings and prayer. And so please, please come for that because we are going to pray the Lord of the harvest that he would send forth laborers into the field. Um, on the back table, there's a bookmark that asks you an interesting question. I don't know if you've ever heard this question before. It asks, who's your one? You might've heard that from time to time. I guess we're not in a mood now, are we? Okay. Um, but this is what I want you to do. Grab this. This is a bookmark that you can keep in um, well, any book that you have in your Bible, and you'll write the person's name down, and then you'll commit to pray for them. And this bookmark is really handy because it gives you various scriptures to read and pray over as you pray for that specific person. And I would encourage you to pick one up. There's plenty of them out there, and so grab one, and uh, I hope it'll be a helpful tool, a tool for you. And I think that's everything. All right, so Brother Barry, where art thou? Okay. <clears throat> He's going to lead us in uh, three or four songs, or however long it takes me to... to Go from Clark Kent to uh, Superman back there, and the, and then we'll make it happen. Okay, thank you. Page four hundred thirteen. Four hundred thirteen. I think it goes right along with the message. Four hundred thirteen. Stand up, stand up for Jesus, and let's just do that. Page four hundred thirteen. Stand up for Jesus. Stand up, stand up for Jesus. Ye soldiers of the cross, lift high his royal banner. It must not suffer loss. From victory unto victory, his army shall he flee. Till every foe is vanquished and Christ is Lord indeed. Stand up, stand up. For Jesus stand in, call obey, forth to the mighty conflict in this his glorious day. Ye that are men now serve him against unnumbered foe. Let courage rise with danger and strength to strength the pole. Stand up, stand up for Jesus, stand in his strength alone. The arm of flesh will fail you, ye dare not trust your own. Put on the gospel armor and watching to prayer, where duty calls or danger be never Wanting there. Turn with me to page number 64. Shall we gather at the river, the baptismal river? Page 64. Shall we gather at the river where bright angel feet have trod? With its crystal tide forever Flowing by the throne of God Yes, we'll gather at the river The beautiful, the beautiful river Gather with the saints at the river That flows by the throne of God This is the coldest water I've ever been in. We may need to check the heater. I'll tell you, this is dedication because I got in and she got in and I said, ooh, do you still want to do this? <laughs> Discipleship, she said, let's do it. She might have muttered, let's get it over with. I don't know, I didn't hear that. I didn't hear that part. But we're going to do this real quick. So I'm giving my speech before she comes in and we're just going to baptize her as quickly as possible. Oh my Lord. All right, come on in. I feel like a fisher. I got my waders on. All right.
This is Janelle Kelly. She's come today to publicly profess her uh, faith and trust in Jesus Christ, and you've accepted Jesus as your Savior? Yes. She said shivering, yes. Well, then I do baptize you, my sister, so this is good. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost, baptized and <laughs> raised <laughs> to walk in newness of life. <laughs> Be more yeah. 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 Wow, wow. Well, praise the Lord. I love you all. It's great seeing you. Let's go and make disciples. Amen? All right. Well, let's pray. Father, we thank you for today. Thank you for your grace, your love, your mercy. And I pray, God, that as we walk with you, that you would minister to our hearts, encourage us, <laughs> give us your mercy, and lead us by your wisdom and to your will that you may be glorified in all things that we do. We pray in Christ's name. Amen. God bless you. You are dismissed.